inviting me for for uh, thank you for uh, organizing this excellent workshop and for the opportunity for uh, sharing my work on the deep learning for uh, accelerating quantitative MRI. Um, so my name is Martin Kahn from uh, Amsterdam UMC within the uh, Quantitative Medical Image Analysis Group. Um, but before diving deep, I thought of, uh, of taking a bit of an uh, informal detour and uh, introduce into my backyard that I explored a bit in the, in the last year, which is my terra incognita, where I started by uh, taking small tours around uh, uh, a small lake uh, in the neighborhood. But uh, over time, um, found out that there's much more to explore there than just this, this single route. For instance, on this rowing course um, in the past weeks of, of winter, uh, we've been able to do some, some ice skating actually there. Um, and then uh, from there, even continue to a, a mountain bike course and do some uh, exercise there as well with my uh, nice uh, Gadda Town uh, uh, in But the point is that I thought perhaps I've not explored more than just 7% of everything that that's to be found there so maybe there's something to discuss uh, later tonight uh, over uh, over a small drink um, and that's um, it's maybe a small bridge to uh, to the topic of today of my presentation to follow up on the uh, excellent previous speakers about quantitative neuroimaging at ultra high fields um, where of course we're interested in in um, multimodal imaging to arrive at parameters of brain tissue um, where we're here focusing on the T1, T2 star and quantitative susceptibility mapping or QSM um, um, as markers for uh, myelin and iron uh, in the brain. Um, what we know is something that is challenging us is that high resolution imaging is motion sensitive and it's also time intensive, it's lengthy. Um, and not only that, after we've acquired the data in the conventional setting, we require approach post-processing through co-registration and other steps um, which might uh, corroborate the, uh, which might the, uh, the resolution that we have obtained. Um, and that brings me sort of to the, uh, the main message of this presentation uh, is that we're seeking for imaging that is multimodal, motion robust and fast to move forward for in vivo imaging in the subcortex. And this is the, uh, the, the key of my, uh, my lecture of this afternoon. Um, allow me to first go into the sequence, then into the, the motion uh, robust imaging before proceeding to accelerated imaging using deep learning. Um, we started by um, um, building this multimodal sequence that's called MP2RH-ME, so the multi-echo MP2RH sequence, by simply extending the second readout of the second inversion of the conventional MP2RH sequence to a um, um, four echo uh, readout so that we have uh, a rich sequence and reducing the dead time to 6% from initially more than 50%. So um, uh, giving us a, a flexible readout with a relatively long echo times for the, for the second readout to, to uh, leverage. And the, the idea is that we arrive with a, with a set of images uh, of these two inversions that we can efficiently use to uh, compute quantitative maps for the different purposes as we framed before. Um, for instance, for T1 mapping, using the date of the first inversion and the first echo time of the second inversion with the phase data added to this. Um, or for T2 star mapping using the, uh, the magnitude images here of only the second inversion multi-echo data. And then of course, we can leverage the phase images of the second inversion to do QSM. So this uh, indeed gives us uh, really uh, coherent, um, inherently co-registered data. So because it was acquired within the same sequence uh, where we can uh, appreciate the contrast in uh, the nuclei as we know that they are there, but then this is all acquired within a single sequence. So this is nicely coherently uh, obtained. And then we proceeded to correct this data in that we chose for uh, adding fat navigators with this flexible setup that was at our disposal. Um, so per TR of the MP2 rates me sequence, we add a 3D EPI um, that's exciting solely flat fat, uh, which serves as a proxy for uh, estimating motion during scanning. Um, 
And then of course we can register these, uh, these volumes, which uh, um, give us the uh, translation and rotation parameters uh, per TR. Um, and we map these to the data of the elliptical shutter readout that we have. Um, and we can correct our data and um, um, have uh, perfectly sharp images, at least that's what we're aiming for. Um, here we see an example of this. On top, we see uh, the, the multimodal images int introduced before. If we then zoom in into a small region, then here we see the uncorrected data and then again the corrected data. And then you can appreciate here in the T1 that the anterior limb of the internal capsule is as a sharp defined, sharply defined as compared to the uncorrected image. And we also see some uh, enlarged uh, vertical uh, uh, Robin spaces that was invisible here in the uncorrected images and then appearing here in the corrected data. And interestingly, in the QSM, it was already visible um, in the phase data, but then slightly attenuated compared to the uh, corrected data. So something we we know is that uh, when we go to high resolution imaging is that motion correction in one way or the other is indispensable. Um, but we sought for a way to quantify this, to actually show, actually show the improvements in sharpness that we obtain um, when correcting for motion. Um, and in this case, we chose for a retrospective motion correction model, allowing us also to compare actually the situation without and with motion correction. So consider that uh, a local cluster centered around a transition boundary between the ventricles and the corpus callosum. Then um, we can sample um, all voxels within this, uh, this cluster, this region of interest, um, and consider the uh, this, this, this uh, intensity the transition boundary over um, uh, over this region of interest uh, and model this using error functions. So we have this immobile shaped uh, functions um, um, that actually um, show this, um, this boundary. And the point is then that after correction, um, we expect uh, this boundary to be sharper. So that if we were to measure the full width at half max of this, uh, of this function, that it would reduce and that would be a uh, uh, a metric for in, uh, increased sharpness in our image. And by using um, an error function parametrization, we obtain this in physical units in millimeters so that we can relate it to the resolution of the data that we required. So we made sure that the that we did the clustering in a, a coherent manner uh, and do this at a sub voxel resolution by sampling using a level set segmentation in uh, local 3D clusters. Um, and that brought us at, um, um, at these results. So we uh, thankfully adopted data from the AHEAD database. Um, this uh, the cohort study um, uh, as published um, the group from Anik Alkmaar and the group of uh, Beate Forsman. So we included 24 subjects. And here we see the sharpness in the uncorrected data or the full width at half max, I should say, against the estimated motion. So we have an aggregate motion score per subject. And we can see a strong correlation, strikingly strong correlation between um, motion and um, this full width at half max uh, in the uncorrected data. Um, and if we then correct for uh, motion, we see that this is gone. So the estimated full width at half max of all subjects resides along the, the nominal resolution of the, of the scan, except for uh, one small outlier here. And also the improvement uh, significantly correlates um, with motion. So the more subjects move, the higher the, the, higher the improvement in, uh, in image quality and sharpness. Um, so this was visible in, uh, in all three modalities. So also in the QSM, we saw this correlation. Um, in R2 star, we saw a significant improvement um, visible over here. So this, so this is an approach that can be applied at uh, the different uh, modalities. And for instance, also in, uh, in subregions, like here in the ventricles and the striatum, we see that we 
um, have a measurable improvement in resolution. Um, and I think this is important. So it gives us a, a, a tool, a, a measure to use also in other applications to actually measure the sharpness in, in motion corrected data. Um, so what's interesting is that we found that the, um, the apparent resolution as measured using this approach um, goes from 0.88 to 0.7 millimeter cubed, uh, which actually is a factor two um, reduction in voxel volume. So it is, uh, it is, it matters to correct for motion. Um, and it's, um, it's visible in, in, in our cohort in all subjects but one, and it's never detrimental. So motion correction matters, and now we have a, a measure to actually um, uh, quantify this and use this. So now that we have our um, multimodal sequence and have the data motion corrected, we can move on to the, uh, to the third part, and that is to um, consider me the measurement time and uh, look for ways to, uh, to reduce the, the, the imaging time. Um, and there actually we need to consider the entire chain of data acquisition and reconstruction, where we usually uh, start with reconstructed images and then proceed by uh, post-processing them. Um, we now consider the entire chain of the sampling pattern uh, as chosen on scanner, raw data that are then obtained and reconstructed. Um, here we go from um, well, from, from full sampling patterns to sparse or even very highly sparse sampling patterns that, of course, then um, lead to a reduction in scanning time. And um, the, the point that I'd like to make here is that uh, deep learning has the promise to uh, accelerate imaging, to make it faster than is currently possible. And the good thing is that we're building on a large body of knowledge and experience in the MR world. So we're not the first one to consider this. And key to this is the embedding of prior knowledge in the reconstruction problem, which already um, started before the change of millennium by the introduction of Sense and Grappa as um, acceleration methods that exploit the coil sensitivity maps as we have them in MR. Um, and that allowed us to, to uh, de-alias the data and remove the unfolding as we see it here in this image. And then came a um, series of methods that exploits, exploited sparsity using, for instance, a wavelet transform. That if we start with sparsely sampled, randomly sparsely sampled data, um, we could solve the, uh, the aliasing. And this is now uh, commonly available uh, on scanners in the, in the clinic. And now we go a step further where, um, with deep learning methods, we aim to learn from data and thereby. Um, in, in, in even further increase this uh, prior knowledge that we use to um, accelerate imaging. And for that, we think it's important, and it's not us, there are many groups that, that propose this to actually um, consider the, the physics, sort of the process of the, the image acquisition, which can be uh, quite well described in the case of MR. So consider a certain image that we wish to acquire we know that um, with MR, this is um, projected on the coil sensitivities S and the Fourier transform F um, to arrive in, in K space where we're actually acquiring data. And then through a sparse sampling operator P, we arrive at a subset of measurements um, from which we then aim to reconstruct our image. And if we were to take a linear inverse, inverse Fourier transform, we see that we have a heavily aliased image. And then our assignment is to um, solve the inverse problem to come from our aliased image to the target image that we're after. And this forward model describes this uh, accurately for us. So now we propose a, uh, a, a structure of a neural network that's called, that we call the recurrent inference machine that actually learns this prior from data. So in contrast to compress sensing, where this was predefined using the wave that transform, the network implicitly learns this from our data. Um, it's physics informed, it has the forward model included. We know how we sparsely sample in Fourier domain and how, um, how we can um, 
uh, uh, formulate this problem uh, accurately. And then our network um, is, has an efficient design because it's reusing network parameters over multiple time steps and iteratively solves this problem as is uh, illustrated in this image here where you see that from the initial uh, alias image, we uh, improve um, in image quality until convergence. So this recurrent uh, infra network infrastructure uh, supports this uh, for us. Now these REMs are um, proposed as uh, general inverse problem solvers. Um, and uh, the group Kai Learning was the, the person uh, implementing the REM for us. I'd just like to make the point that REMs can be generally applied for uh, inverse problems in imaging uh, because they, uh, they seek to focus on uh, learning parameters uh, rather than imaging features. So if you're uh, in your research, um, uh, dealing with inverse problems that you're solving, uh, the ARIA might be uh, of interest for you. I won't go into details of the of the network, uh, just to say that it's an, uh, an iterative approach. So here we see uh, over two iterations, the network displayed. So the, the parameters are shared over iterations. Uh, and per iteration, the current estimate of the image is given along with the log likelihood gradients. And there it's actually where the, uh, the, the forward model with uh, the MR physics embedded is, is included in the network. Um, and if this is passed through the network, we uh, have an update delta x, which is added to the current estimates of the image after which we proceed. And this recurrent approach is beneficial because we see that over iterations, over time step, the error is reducing until convergence so that's why we chose here total eight time steps to uh, before uh, before we terminate the reconstruction. And interestingly, um, it's not a whole lot of data that is needed to train this network. Um, because of the way this problem is formulated, we can treat slices uh, as individual samples. We are solving the problem of uh, reconstruction in, in 2D, so that from a single data set, we already have a. Um, a large number of measurements that can be used to train the network. And here we see, for instance, that 4x, fourfold acceleration, um, that um, the, the training converges at some error um, for only 10 subjects. So this is encouraging for, um, for this field. Uh, in experiments, we actually see that it is beneficial to learn a prior. So compared to compressed sensing, we see that uh, that a recurrent inverse machine uh, achieves a higher structural similarity um, at two acceleration factors. Um, and this even translates over modalities. So here the training data were 70 T to star data. And if we then reconstruct three, three Tesla T1 weighted images, we also achieve high SSIM relative to, um, to compressed sensing. So to some extent, there, these networks have uh, uh, generalization, generalization uh, capacity. Uh, this was confirmed by a neuroradiologist as well. I'll skip over this. Um, in challenges, we see that um, we have a, a good way to uh, uh, assess the performance of networks. Um, and we've been quite successful in, um, uh, in, in a number of these challenges that um, uh, fast MRI group in New York and the Cowry group that had 3 dt one data. And this really helps us to learn how methods perform and um, um, also when they start to fail at high acceleration factors. So now the next step is to move to quantitative MRI. Uh, and here we're focusing on, uh, on R2 star mapping. This is work of uh, Chao Ping Zhang uh, in our group. Um, where we have a, a well-known model for, uh, for R2 star over multiple echoes. Um, and here we have, uh, we are um, considering the complex value signal. So that's where the B naught uh, term is coming in. Um, and commonly, um, we're acquiring an image for every uh, echo. Um, and then um, do the inverse Fourier transform and fit a signal model to uh, arrive at our R2 star map. But the scan time can be long, especially for high resolution imaging. So here we're proposing to subsample case space 
um, and instead of um, reconstructing uh, directly by taking the Fourier transform, um, um, we're proposing a model to reconstruct the parameter map directly from K space. So um, the QRIM is a network that uh, that aims to um, estimate an R to star map directly from K space data from this uh, multi echo uh, gradient echo sequence. Um, the forward model is then an extension from what I showed before, where we um, uh, had the, the basic model to go um, to, to explain the relation between image and case space. And here we have the, um, the relaxation model for, uh, for R to star. Um, well, we can um, bring these two together to arrive at a unified forward model describing the image of the signal in case space um, as a function of R to star. And then we use this model um, in the recurrent inference machine for, uh, for reconstruction. Um, again, within the network, we define the log likelihood um, using this model that I just described, whereas the prior is uh, implicitly learned by, by the network. Um, and uh, again, this log likelihood gradient is um, fed into the network as I uh, described before. Um, basically, um, uh, we initialize uh, the network using the conventional RAM and the least squares fitting, and then perform a, um, a training of our network. Um, and in this experiment, we had uh, 17 subjects for training um, and did some validation and testing uh, over a number of acceleration factors. Um, and then this brings us at some results. Um, where we showed where we plot for um, nine subjects individually here the root mean square error uh, as a function of acceleration factor. So we're considering um, data from three to 12 fold accelerated, where in blue we have the reference methods, which is the conventional RAM plus least squares fitting. And then in orange, we see the quantitative RAM um, with the unified approach from K space to, uh, to an R to star map. Um, and if we unite these findings, then here we have the delta root mean square error um, of the, um, and the conventional approach and then the unified model. And there we see that um, that we have an improvement. So uh, um, a reduction in error that increases with acceleration factor. Um, so uh, the, more the, the more we accelerate, the more we benefit from taking such a unified approach. And this may, I think, may also be intuitive because we have uh, less data, so it is, um, uh, it's, the data is more sparsely sampled, so we benefit more from this unified approach that as we approach it here, as we propose it here. Um, and indeed, this is also um, visible qualitatively, so if we consider here the, the putainment at a 12-fold acceleration, uh, we see some sort of slight blur in the, the conventional approach, and this is um, um, reduced. So we have a, a better defined transition boundary here as compared to the, the reference uh, image. And then if we reduce the acceleration factor, then you see indeed that the difference becomes less apparent between the two approaches. So where brings this uh, us? So we have proposed a unified forward model for joint reconstruction and uh, parameter estimation. Um, we see that this reduces the root mean square error um, and actually shows improved sharpness um, in this uh, on the boundary of the, of the putainment. Um, and for higher acceleration factors, um, the improvement was more apparent. Well, this was just a start. We're now expanding this work to uh, two more subjects. Um, and of course, with this flexible approach, um, um, we can also consider other uh, quantitative parameters of interest. And also, we aim to evaluate um, our method using this sharpness metric as introduced for motion uh, correction. Um, we think this can also be of, um, uh, of interest in, uh, in reconstruction problems. Also, then we can proceed by integrating motion models in the forward model so that we can use deep learning to uh, correct for motion um, in the uh, image acquisition. So there's uh, 
a lot of work to do to uh, further expand the terra incognita. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, so we have a, a GitHub repository with a code of our, um, of our network. Um, I'd like to uh, thank sponsors and people in the group um, who worked on, the, on this together with me, and also collaborators at the University of Amsterdam, uh, other universities um, in the Netherlands and abroad. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Matam.